Okay, well, hi. Uh, this is the Ultimate Electron Upgrade in a Nutshell talk. Um, basically, I'm going to talk through the 18 page startup thread about this very long running project uh, with facial expressions and stories from my childhood. So, I'm, I'm Philip Pearson. I've been a startup member under the name Myelin for a while now. I uh, joined right after winning an eBay auction in April 2016 for an Acorn Electron. My first piece of Acorn hardware in about 30 years, and now it's start of uh, a bit of a collection. Um, occupying quite a lot of my garage now. So um, this project's been going since about 2015. It's involved quite a few people. It started off with a wish list, lots of dreaming, turned into a very nice FPGA design. It's now gained not one, but two, maybe three custom circuit boards, uh, one of which is my contribution. So basically the project, it's a replacement for the ULA at the core of the Electron. It brings higher speeds, extra memory, maybe better video, uh, and it has a whole lot of future potential once, once you get around to implementing it. Um, I imagine everyone knows what an Electron is. Uh, just to fill in any gaps, fundamentally cost-reduced version of the BBC Micro. Um, with pretty much all the circuitry, all the digital circuitry implemented in one giant ULA chip. Uh, much smaller because of this, uh, but missing tons of um, interfacing. Uh, Biggest limitation it has four bit memory. Um, the 6502 still sees eight bit, um, an eight bit bus, but there's only four one bit wide DRAM chips. And so uh, every memory access takes two uh, DRAM transactions. Um, this means it has at best half the memory bandwidth of the BBC Micro. Um, at worst, way, way worse, uh, some video modes. Uh, in some video modes, the 6502 is only actually running um, during blanking periods. Um, it's got simpler video, there's some scrolling limitations, I believe the, um, the start address of the, uh, the, the screen, start address of the screen memory is settable but only at a fairly um, granular level, something like 32 or 64 bytes. So the smooth scrolling doesn't work nearly as well in games. There's no mode 7, um, the audio is basically bit banged. It's basically a GPIO, so you can um, you can turn. It's a, it's a square wave that gets filtered a bit um, at the end. Um, the tape is more or less what it is in the DVC, I think. But instead of a uh, whole ULA just for the tape, it's um, it's just a little bit of this one. Um, the keyboard is a little bit weird. The columns of the keyboard are wired up to the CPU's address bus, um, something I've never seen before. Um, and then the, the rows go back to pins on the ULA. And then the disk interface is gone, Econet's gone, no user port, no tube. The one megahertz bus is sort of still there, um, but not quite in its same form. Instead, there's a PCB edge connector at the back of the machine that brings out all of the 6502's bus, plus a few other internal signals, power, sound, etc. And so, you know, everything's up to the peripheral design. So as such, we ended up with a whole lot of peripherals that plug into the back of the electron. First is Acorns Plus One. Uh, if you have pictures from the retro kit, um, this brings, this brought the, the ROM interface and the one megahertz bus out into a more convenient cartridge port. Um, and uh, which, which is kind of interesting because now, you, now you've got all these things which, which really just plug straight into the, the top of the machine, makes things very accessible. Um, plug in game cartridges, uh, and then there's a lot of third party things, you know, many, many designs from Deck Hitchens, um, they, um, yeah, with sorts of others. There's this photo from Chris Acorns, and this is roughly the machine that I had when I was five years old. Um, my first home computer was an Electron. I was uh, five at the time, growing up in New Zealand. Uh, my parents bought it. It was about somewhere between four and six years before we got our next computer, which was a 286, I believe. So the Electron accumulated lots of expansions over the years. First a plus one, dot matrix printer, then a plus three. I think at some point it gained some sideways RAM, had the plus three modified a bit too because uh, I've got some DFS formatted three and a half inch floppies, which I believe are a bit of a rarity. Um, I have kind of childhood memories of unscrewing 
the case, when it, when it started getting really crashy, I would unscrew the case and I would pop the OLA out and kind of blow the dust off or whatever I thought I was doing at, at that age and uh, put it, popping, the, popping it back in and crossing my fingers. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I thought it was the CPU, I, uh, but yeah. Um, so, so that was, that was uh, over 30 years ago now. Um, so I, I bought the, got that Electron off eBay um, a couple of years back and I've, I've been designing a series of ever more complicated add-ons since. Um, so this brings us you know, to, the, to the UEU. It's, it's kind of a, the concept is kind of a holy grail expansion that brings back everything that's missing from the B um, and adds in kind of, you know, the kind of kitchen sink of whatever everyone wanted. Um, so the start up thread of this, about this uh, begins at the start of 2015. Uh, Dave Hitchens, David B and Paul B drinking in Oslo, dreaming of a ULA replacement that would turn, in, turn the elk into this all singing, all dancing power machine. Uh, the idea of, uh, Desolder the ULA, fit a socket, uh, and have an FPGA in there, have a physical switch to select between normal mode, just a bog standard electron, enhanced mode, which is still, still an electron, it still feels like an electron, but it has fast memory, um, uh, better sound, all that sort of stuff, and then, and then another setting for full beam emulation. And then later on in the thread, people came up with you know, sideways RAM, and video, video, all that sort of stuff. So much discussion about all this it culminated in Hoglet making the Electron FPGA project in late 2015, uh, which implemented the entire ULA and VHDL, and uh, also the rest of an Electron emulator to test it. So here it is running on a um, the PLBO Duo, Duo and a, with the classic computing shield. Um, oops, where am I? Uh, yeah. In mid 2016, uh, Dave Hitchens then desoldered the ULA from an Electron, fitted a socket made a PCB that, that plugged in there and broke out all the signals. Um, so later that year, Hoglet got an Electron working using this board and his code running on the Helio. And uh, it amazingly, it worked. Uh, lots and lots of flying leads. Um, I can only imagine what the, what the, the signals actually look like here. But uh, it worked. Here's a, a picture of a screen. Um, so that was really cool. Uh, um, so we're up to, I believe, yeah, uh, late 2016 at this point. So this is two years before I even had an electronic game. Um, so some, sometime later, I'd, I'd been following the UEU thread and considering if it was possible for a while. It's fairly straightforward, a bit of work, but nothing, um, most Prizes, make a board with an FPGA and some buffers. But making one that could really improve on the electron's capabilities and still close didn't seem practical. So I wasn't, I wasn't even aiming to protect either of these projects at this point. I just wanted to do something interesting with an electron and I, I really wanted to have an internal expansion. Replacing the ULA felt like too much work. I wasn't confident enough that I'd be able to. I really want to do an internal expansion. So the CPU socket of one volts, because you know none of you know there aren't really any five volt FPGAs that are still active and available these days. Um, so I made this adapter, um, desoldered the CPU. keeping your options open type thing. Um, so here it is with FPGA dev board. It says, uh, it's a Spartan 6 FPGA um, and a Raspberry Pi. Uh, uh, so yeah, I still didn't know what I wanted to do, but I'd shown to stick an FPGA into an electron, so have it work. Also that the tube worked, not really any software liked it very much, but it worked. So time went by, I happened to decide I wanted to experiment with BGA chips. 
basically all the interesting looking all the interesting looking chips seem to be in VGA, a horrible format for hobbyists. But um, I figured if I could get it working, it would open up a lot of possibilities. Uh, also, four layer boards are really expensive to make, so I tried to get it to work on a two layer board. I figured if I could get it to work on a two layer board, then um, it's it's, it's practical to make tiny four-layer boards, but it's quite also quite practical to make quite large two-layer boards. They're pretty affordable. So if I could get the uh, BGA chip working on a two-layer board, then I could have a fairly retro-looking board just with this one BGA chip right in the middle. Um, and that, yeah, I've got lots of potential. So surprisingly, this actually worked. I, I've had many people tell me big BGA chips like this, this is a 0.8 millimeter pitch, 169 pin BGA. But it did actually work on this little dev board here. Um, I couldn't get all the pins out, but I got enough of them. Uh, the first time I tried soldering it, I made a complete hash of it. I didn't have a stencil, I didn't have any solder paste, so I just kind of tried to get some solder on all of the, on all of the pads, um, and I reflowed it on top. About half of the pins seem to work. I could program it with JTAG, uh, but when I tried to actually do something useful with it, I, I found many, many of the pins that just not connected or something. Um, but I, uh, I made a second one with a stencil and it worked beautifully. Here it is inside an electron on that, um, on that board in the, in the earlier slide. Um, it's, uh, it's that thing right in the center with the, all of the wires attached to it. Um, it's the, the BGA board didn't actually, uh, wasn't actually big enough to cover all of the pins on my adapter. So there's a bunch of flying leads to, um, to connect to them. But yeah, amazingly this one worked. I, it implements a bit of sideways RAM. I, there were all sorts of things I could have done with it, but I just kind of ran out of enthusiasm after doing the sideways RAM. I was like, it was obvious I would never be able to close the case with this thing, but I would proven that I could use a BGA. So that was cool. Sometime later, I ended up making, uh, we've got one here. This thing's called Arc Flash. It is a um, ROM emulator for the four ROM Archimedes machines. It's got a CPLD and some flash on it, uh, 16 megabytes of flash, so it's a pick between operating systems. So the CPLD here, it's, it's another 0.8 millimeter BGA, and the flash chips are 1.0 millimeter pitch BGAs. Um, and this one worked. So I, I, was, I was sure that this wouldn't solve it right, but it, it did, it worked just fine. So um, this gave me a bit more confidence. Um, now, six plus months later, I uh, basically, the, I think the consensus on the ultimate electron upgrade thread was that it would never happen, it was too much work and it would be really unreliable. Uh, some, one, a new member showed up in early 2019 who was very, very enthusiastic about the project and um, wouldn't drop it even though we were all very discouraging about it. Um, he kept being enthusiastic to the point that I started getting enthusiastic about it too. So um, I was like, whatever, let's try making a circuit board for it. Maybe it'll only work for me, um, but it's, it's worth a try. It probably won't be that hard compared to this last thing that I've just done. Uh, in hindsight, actually, it turned out to be several times harder than the last thing. Um, it's by far the most difficult board I've ever designed. So. Um, it started out with the ULA footprint um, and the, uh, it's, it's based on the board from Dave Hitchens, his, uh, his breakout, um, well, figured out the pinout and everything. Um, so it's the same size as that. I believe it's the, the biggest board that you could fit into the Electron without interfering, without covering the RAM chips and without, um, without interfering with a master RAM board. Uh, so I started with the OLA footprint, added the FPGA, basically copied and pasted from my other project, the flash chip from Arc Flash. I spent ages trying to figure out how to fit a VGA output in there for video NULA support. Um, just couldn't figure it out. There was no way you'd be able to have an F uh, a VGA cable coming out of the Electron's case. It would have to be, you know, some flat cable or something. I didn't want to drill holes in the case anyway, so I went back forth on this for a while and then eventually just punted on it and said, okay, let's just make it RGB open. Um, added SDRAM, which is the, the other BGA chip just to the right of the FPGA there. Um, at this point, I started to get concerned about pin count. I thought 169 pins would be far more than we'd need, but actually they were disappearing quickly. Uh, Chris Morley uh, noted that a QPI flash chip, it's, it looks 
uh, which uh, you would imagine would be really slow. It's, uh, everything is over just six pins, but you noted that you could get it um, to fetch a byte in 200 nanoseconds, which would actually be okay for, for an electron. So uh, I ditched the flash from my other board and stuck this little eight pin thing in instead. It's been ages and ages working through all the buffers. Uh, this, the um, a big, big problem with this board was that it was the, something like half, this, half the board would have been covered in buffers if I was using normal sized uh, buffer chips. But I found these, um, these tiny little BGA buffers. They were the 74LBT162245. Um, I was excited about LBT. LBT seemed fast and five volt tolerant and uh, it has uh, 22 ohm resistors on its outputs, which um, terminates things a little and should hopefully make the high speed uh, signals from the FPGA a little more palatable to the, um, to the, to the slower logic on the outside. Um, so that's what those, those two BGA chips inside the ULA socket there. Um, uh, what else have we got for audio? Um, I, I, I was considering just making this a GPIO, but um, I thought, what the hell, we've got some room, let's add a DAC. So I put a, something like a 24-bit DAC on there for our electrons uh, little one-bit output. Uh, that's it in the bottom right. Uh, and then disaster struck. I, um, I've been feeling really sick for a while and ended up getting diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and having to take a break for a month to say I could barely see. Turns out um, when you have really, really high blood sugar and then you start going insulin and it, the blood sugar goes down, uh, the sugar stays in your eyes for a really long time takes about a month for that to go away. So I could barely see for a month. Um, I was despairing of not being able to solder ever again, but uh, luckily that, that, that all went away. So, so that was nice. Uh, and I can get back to this project. Um, so yeah, about after a bit more work, I had something that started to look like a circuit board. I, I posted this picture and got some interesting comments on Stardot. People realized how, how terrible this one was going to be to solder at home. Um, here's a, here's a uh, Close up of the FPGA and the SD RAM. So the SD RAM is the thing on the right. You can see the ULA socket down the bottom. Uh, I managed to, the, this was my first time, work, uh, actually no, my second time working with these design rules. Um, you can see you could fit four traces in between every pair of pins on the, on the ULA, which um, I was sure would create horrible crosstalk, but and, and miraculously seemed to work okay. And, and finally, here we go. This is the board I sent off for fabrication. Um, so this, uh, I did that at JLC PCB in China. Um, I've heard, I've heard some horror stories from JLC, but, uh, my four layer experience with them has, has always been good. I, I didn't push it as far as it could be. They said, they claim that you can do 3.5 mil traces in spaces, but I, I, I use five mil. Uh, so this is still five thousandths of an inch, which is pretty tiny. I, um, uh, what is that? That's about an eighth of a millimeter, I think. Um, but yeah, so this, uh, this one, it, it turned out quite well. Here's a, here's a microscope picture of the, um, the FPGA uh, footprint. It's, it's pretty cool. You can see, um, so FPGA footprints are kind of, uh, are kind of weird. Um, whereas with normal, um, with, uh, with most chips, with, with TSOPs and SOICs and stuff, you, you, you have a big enough pad that you, you kind of don't really need to think about the geometry of the pad. Um, you just have a big rectangular pad, solder mask around the outside, the solder is fine. With BGA, there's two ways to do it. They call them SM, confusingly, they call them SMD and NSMD. SMD is solder mask defined, NSMD is non-solder mask defined. This is non-solder mask defined. You can, tell, you can tell it's that way because the pads are actually smaller than the solder mask openings. So you can see that's why there's a little halo around every um, every pad here. What this what this um, uh, enables is when the BGA sits on top of this, when it's soldered in, the balls will the, the, the FPGA will settle a little bit further. Um, also, it lets you use smaller pads, which is great when you're kind of running up against the design rule limits. Um, I I think if I did NSMD for this, I wouldn't have been able to fit the vias in between the pads on the PGA. Um, you know, obviously, that's an essential. There's no way I'd get those uh, signals out without that. I think people typically um, use more than four layers for um, the size PGA, but um, I was okay with some trade-offs. So yeah, this worked out well. 
here's the actual board uh, with all the surface mount components soldered. Um, it took about two hours. Um, from stenciling, you, you put the circuit board down on a flattest surface you can find. And there's a stainless steel stencil, which has been laser cut with little openings for where the solder should go. So you very carefully orient it over the top, uh, squeeze some solder paste on and squeegee it over. Very carefully take it off, hope that you haven't made a mess of it. Place all the components with tweezers and then you put the whole thing, ideally in a surface mount oven, but um, I just put it on a hot plate. There's a video somewhere else on YouTube of me um, uh, reflowing something on a hot plate. Uh, it's, it's a $20 thing um, I got from Amazon sometime and works just fine. Uh, uh, you can, it, it seems to also work quite well for, it, it works well for the tiny components and it works quite well for the big things that sit on top. Um, I hear it's very good for things where they're on top of the board and they have big plastic housings which melt in a surface mount oven, they work fine on a hot plate. So uh, it's, it's been my um, assembly method of choice. Here it is with all the hand soldering done for, for all the, um, the through hole components. Uh, lots and lots and lots of pins to poke down into the ULA socket and then a bunch to come up. There's the JTAG connector so I can program the FPGA in the bottom right here. Um, on the left, uh, connectors for the debug microcontroller. Um, and here it is in an electron. This was not actually running yet. I just stuck it in here so that, um, uh, so that I knew that it would actually fit and it did. So that was nice. Um, I then took it straight out, powered it up, some smoke came out, which was scary, but everything seemed to work okay. I didn't have no idea what the smoke was for a little while later. It turned out I soldered one of the buffers the wrong way around, 180 degrees out. Luckily it was not one of the BGAs, it was the, um, it was the little TSOP, it was a 74HCT125 um, in the bottom left corner of the, uh, the ULA socket. So I could desolder it, stuck another one on, and it worked. So the, the bring up process for a board like this, you kind of try, you sort of start from the outside and you go in. I got some code running on the debug microcontroller, the, the, uh, the chip in the bottom left corner. And then the FPGA, just something simple that would pass through the SPI connection from the microcontroller to the flash. Uh, then I could verify that the flash was responding by talking to it from the microcontroller, managed to program some stuff into it for use when I got everything else working. Um, and then I checked all the pins one by one. I had a, um, basically a resistor connected to a wire which plugged into either power or ground and I would touch it to each of the pins one by one and then run a, a debug command through the microcontroller in the FPGA which would read out what it thought the pins were. Everything worked. So that was a small miracle. Usually something is, usually there's some subtle mistake somewhere but um, I guess I'd obsessed over it enough. I'd, um, I'd, let this I'd let this circuit board design sit for quite a while um, while I thought about it before I actually fabricated it. That's a good payoff. Um, so after fitting the new 74HCT125, its outputs also worked. So it was time to go into an electron. So I plugged it in and nothing happened. No video output. Uh, I didn't have a scope at the time, a logic analyzer, but um, this the Salier unit you can see there. Um, but uh, no video, so I managed to blink the caps lock LED so I could tell that the FPGA was running, but um, caps lock is just a GPIO basically. Um, so there were all sorts of things that could be wrong. Um, the, F the ULA generates the clock for the system and um, I knew that it would generate an extremely sh a clock with extremely sharp edges, which would probably cause issues, um, especially once you plug the whole lot of stuff into the back. So I put a little filter on the end of the clock, uh, filter on the output to try to smooth it out a little. I, um, that I, I suspected maybe it was just completely removing the clock. Instead of smoothing it, it was turning it into just a, a little wiggle. So I desoldered the capacitor there and then something came to life. I think I could see, I could see something using the, um, using Hoglet's uh, 6502 decoder at this point. Um, but uh, it was not making it very far into the boot process. It was, it was reading something out of the ROM. So yay, ROM input was working, the address and data bus were working fine. Uh, clock was working, but um, I, it, it turned out that the ULA is supposed to pull up the NMI and the IRQ pins in the 6502, and mine wasn't. So um, 
you can't see it on here. I guess this is this photo was taken before I figured this bug out. Uh, there's, like, there's a couple of three-hole resistors, a couple of yeah three-hole resistors soldered on top of the now working one. Uh, so after that, I um, I turned it on and an Acorn Electron banner showed up, and then quickly scrolled off the screen to be replaced by lots and lots of ads. So uh, so it was alive. It was reading from the ROM. Something was going, um, but not everything. So uh, once again, Hoglet helped figure this one out. Um, 602 decoder was indispensable. I could take a trace of the um, of the startup process and um, and upload it to Stardot for a further analysis. Problem here was that the um, those buffers, the 74H, uh, 74LDTs that I was so excited about, happened to have the thing called bus hold. Now, bus hold is really cool. Fundamentally, what it is is uh, and all the all the CPLDs I use have this as well. Um, it's designed to make it so that bus lines don't float. They just keep the value that's on them. It's a, basically a buffer with a big resistor on the end, and the input is connected to the output of the resistor, and then this is connected to the bus line. So what it does is when somebody's driving the bus, nothing, it doesn't do anything. But when nobody's driving the bus, this, um, the, the, the buffer takes the current value on the bus and then passes it back out through this big resistor. Now the, the Xilinx CPLDs that we, the XC9500s that uh, are used in most projects on Stardot are, um, there, the resistor on them is about 50K. And so I expected that the LVTs would be the same, but no, the LVTs are designed for really high speed stuff and their resistor is about 5K. So um, this basically overpowers everything. Um, it's caused a problem later on, but um, in this case, what it did was it meant that uh, the LDA or LDY instruction or whatever it was that um, that the the OS used to uh, to check for the existence of a ROM in an empty space was instead returning um, the last byte of the instruction, um, and so this this resulted in in the, in the OS uh, thinking that there was a ROM, a language ROM in position fifteen, and trying to execute it and whatever I think. Uh, I think the first thing it does is it reads out the title of the ROM and prints it. And so um, I guess uh, this resulted in a never ending string of ads. So here we go. So after, um, so I got the FPGA to uh, instead just return uh, FF bytes for everything and the higher ROMs and it came to life, but the keyboard didn't. It was killed by the bus hole. The, um, how the Electron's keyboard works is uh, like, like most keyboards, it's open uh, open collector. So there's a, there's a bunch of there's some 33k pull-ups which um, result in the lines reading high when no keys are pressed, and when you press a key, one of the lines goes low. Except 33k pull-up versus a 5k bus hold resulted in um, a very slow or non-existent uh, high level on the pin. So um, some keys kind of worked. Most keys read as something else. Uh, it was obvious the keyboard was sort of working, but just not very well. Um, Here's a view of what was going on. It, uh, this is, so this is basically the hack that I implemented to make the keyboard work, was to massively stretch out the um, clock cycle it's out to about three microseconds um, when reading the keyboard, because it took quite a lot longer than uh, it was supposed to, to, to rise back up to the one level. So this, this made it work. Amazingly, or amazingly, as we like to say here, um, uh, it made it work, but everything was really slow. Trying to play games was terrible. Um, yeah, the Electron ran even slower than normal, so the, uh, the Ultimate Electron upgrade was a bit of a downgrade at this point. Um, but here we are, very crisp, very crisp video output, thanks to the, um, the CMOS buffers I was using. Uh, successful, if slow keyboard input, so this was very exciting. Um, and it, I was, Pretty daunted by the, the buffer situation, um, but it turned out that there were uh, there was another buffer in the same package. I thought I'd been very clever by finding this BGA package. It made made it possible to make this very small board, uh, and then I thought I'd painted myself into a corner by uh, making it so I could only use these buffers that weren't going to work. Uh, but it turned out that normal buffers, seven for LVCs, were available in that BGA package. So I got a few of those and soldered up another board. Um, here's proof that it worked, and check it out, it's even working with an external ROM. 
So this was pretty cool. The, uh, the UEU at this point, it's reading, it's using the Electron's uh, OS ROM. It's running with an actual 6502. It's just emulating the ULA. So all the interfacing seems to be working pretty well. Uh, not one, but two Mega Games cartridges in this picture. But um, uh, yeah, so the next next thing to get working was the um, the cassette port, which actually wasn't that much work. Um, I have that implemented with a. I'd, I'd seen some notes from Hoglet about the difficulty of getting it working if you have the cassette input going straight into a GPIO. So I put a comparator instead, and some uh, had it analog coupled. Um, uh, through it, actually, I think it's I think it's coupled through a capacitor on the outside, and so I um, I did some bio I had a, a biasing circuit. Everything had the um, the output pulled to the center of the biasing circuit, and a comparator. So I compared between what was coming in and the center of the bias circuit. So all all I really care about are the, the transitions, whether the uh, whether the waves above the zero volt level or below, and it worked just fine. Um, I it feels more reliable than my old electron in the agents, so I'm pretty happy with that. QPI flash, I I don't remember exactly, but I, I believe that one worked. That was easier to get working than I thought. Um, it's a relatively complicated protocol, but I managed to drive it at, uh, so the, the FPGA runs it, it's got a 96 megahertz clock. Uh, and weird stuff happens when you try to run things actually at the clock rate of the, try to do external interfacing actually at the clock rate of the FPGA, which I'll, I'll talk about later if we've got time. But um, so I just did all the interface to get half the clock rate of the FPGA. So 48 megahertz, that works just fine. Um, uh, I got I, I squared S working, the audio output. This is something where it, it, feel, it felt kind of daunting. I thought I squared S was some complicated protocol that you know only high-end audio use, but actually it's pretty simple compared to most of the memory interface and stuff that, that uh, I was going to have to do. Um, so yeah, next on the list, SDRAM. SDRAM is terrible. It's really complicated. Um, instead of uh, uh, the, um, compared to SRAM that you know usually goes into uh, expansion projects or DRAM, asynchronous DRAM, as you see in you know, the Electron, BBCs. Um, SDRAM runs at a really high speed. It's pipelined and command based. The idea here is that the latency of SDRAM is not actually much better than memory we had in the 80s. But the clock rate is miles faster. So even though it still takes 40 nanoseconds to get a byte out, uh, you talk to it at up to 166 megahertz for this chip. And once you've got one byte out, the next byte comes out one clock later. So um, I was talking to it at 48 megahertz at the time. Uh, so it took, um, I, was, I was using the code for 96 megahertz, but I was using a 48 megahertz clock. Um, so it took, you, you activate a row, and then you wait two clocks. Then you activate a column, wait two clocks, and then data starts coming out. And when you're done reading data, you have to do a pre-charge command so to basically write the data back into the RAM, and that takes another two clocks. So we're talking six blocks to access one byte, which is the, basically the worst possible way to access SDRAM, but it turns out that it's just fine for us. Uh, 60 nanoseconds to access, access a byte is actually pretty, actually just fine when you have 250 nanosecond uh, clock rates. Um, the worst bug in this was that um, basically the, the SDRAM is 16 bits wide, but I only need eight bits of that. Uh, Trying to be efficient, I um, basically the I use the, the low bit of the address to select from the, the the upper half or the lower half. I was writing everything correctly using the upper and lower bank strobes, but when I was reading, I would always use D zero to seven, and so every other byte would be incorrect. So I would uh, the electron would start up and it would say Aquan electron 160k, and then I would use SR load to load something in, and it would crash immediately. Um, Oh, uh, this is stuff to maybe talk about later with SDRAM and clocking. Um, I'm going to skip these. Here is mode seven. Well, mostly working. This is what happens when you get the clock wrong. So the FPGA I used, um, the FPGA I used uh, doesn't, so it, it has block RAM, but 
it doesn't let you initialize the block wrap. So uh, the Spartan 6 that, that you're probably familiar with, uh, you, can, you, can, you can initialize your block wrap. You can say, I need 16K of memory, and it should start out with the contents of the electrons OS ROM. Can't do that with the Max 10, at least the, the compact feature version, which is the affordable one, which only requires one power supply and not three. Um, so what I had to do was to get the uh, mode seven character data, I had to write code that would read it out of the QPI flash and write it into the SDRAM. So before the electron boots, it, it does this little burst of reads from the flash and writes into the SDRAM. Um, oh, sorry, not into the SDRAM, the uh, block RAM. Um, uh, so yeah, and also I got the clock wrong. I, I forget exactly, but I, just, I like I like how this looks. Uh, the um, uh, usually if you read from screen memory wrong, you get pixels missing. But um, how teletext mode works is that actually it's, it's, a, it's a character mode, and so you get whole characters missing. Uh, fixing the clock, ta-da, it looks nice now. <laughs> um, so here we go, yeah. Um, working mode seven. I don't really know what to do with mode seven on an electron. It's used for everything in the BBC, but you know, it's, it's not there in the electron, so no one uses it. Um, but it works. Here, uh, I took a, had a bit of a break here. This, we're up to August two th uh, 2019 by now. So I took, uh, I took the unit to the Vintage Computer Festival in Mountain View. Uh, and uh, basically, nobody was interested in it, because nobody there knows anything about Acorn machines. Um, there, we, um, uh, we, we had an A3010. Uh, and people were very excited by that, because everyone's heard about ARM, but they didn't realize that ARM is the Acorn risk machine. And, you know the, the origins of it, and so seeing this this machine that was actually the, the ARM chip was actually designed for was very exciting. But um, the, there was a, some familiarity with the BBC's computer literacy project, um, but the Electron, no, that no one really knew about the Electron, and some guys' FPGA board for the Electron was even less interesting. So um, I was a bit demoralised at this point. Uh, but then I made this board pictured and sent it to Dave Hitchens, and he took it to Abo. So yay, people who knew what this was about got to see it. This one had other keyboard issues, um, which uh, uh, the, Dave gave the board to Hoglet, and he uh, noticed that the um, uh, on keyboard reads, the ULA wasn't correctly stretching the clock at all. So you, you saw that earlier slide of me wildly stretching the clock to make it work. Well, it turns out we had the opposite problem here. It was, uh, We've just got a, um, a 250 nanosecond clock cycle instead of a microsecond, so it just wasn't working at all. Um, it turned out this was because of some synchronization that I'd added, because we had an asynchronous address signal coming straight into a block RAM, which really felt like the sort of thing that you shouldn't do in a FPGA. So I'd uh, put some synchronization in, but it also resulted in the ULA code catch getting, um, getting the address a cycle too late and stretching the wrong cycle for the, for the keyboard. Fixing that, ta-da, keyboard works well. Now the keyboard lines get up to five volts before the, the fall and clock edge, and so yeah, it was reading properly. Um, so I made another one. Here it is in my, um, my electron. Uh, thank you to Dave Hitchens. He gave me this electron. He, um, and a plus one, and a plus three. It's everything, so I could test it. Um, so I Eventually, I decided to go get the SDRAM working properly, figuring out all of the crazy clocking stuff you need to do to get it working at the actual rate of the FPGA. Um, much time learning about set input delay and set output delay for FPGA people. Uh, uh, so yeah, this brings us to early December last year. I pretty much haven't touched this project since. Um, although, after writing this talk, now I'm, uh, I realize there's all sorts of interesting things that I can do with it. Uh, most annoying thing is that those BGA buffers, which form, which were basically the reason that I could make this board fit, have been discontinued. It turns out when you're really clever and you use chips that are hard to find and aren't documented super well, the suppliers tend to decide that they, no one uses them and they should ditch them. So um, I'm going to have to, uh, going to have to replace those with something. I'm not looking forward to that, but there will be another spin of this board. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Budgie, who may be on this call, I'm not quite sure, um, another um, uh, poster on the Ultimate Electron Upgrade thread, has made his own um, 
uh, his own uh, ULA board with uh, the, the same FPGA, but not in BGA package and entirely using TSOP buffers. Um, so without the SDRAM and things, he's going for the, um, the ULA replacement rather than kitchen sink trying to um, try to add in everybody, everything we could think of approach, uh, but managed to make it fit. So that's exciting. I'm going to ask him if I can steal his, um, his layout for those and uh, for the next release of this. Um, so yeah, which means it's probably time for a demo. Uh, here we are. It's Elite running on a machine without a CPU. <laughs> so this, uh, I, at some point, I um, got the soft CPU. It's so using the T65, um, the T65 6502 uh, module, the HDL module. Um, uh, so this, the FPGA is actually emulating the CPU right now. Um, this electron is basically an I/O device. Uh, the analog stuff is working, but the um, it's not the DRAM's not being used. Oh, the ROMs. Uh, I think I'm reading out of the ROM. Um, but the, the CPU is actually inside the, it's, it's actually on the ULA board. Um, but it's got an SD card, so it does MMFS. All the flash works. Uh, so I, um, I dumped out the contents of my uh, Mega Games cartridge and wrote them all into the flash. And um, with a couple of lines of VHDL, I have an internal Mega Games cartridge. So this, this machine here without a plus one, it has a Mega Games cartridge. <laughs> so here we go. It's a little. It, I may need to. I found that Mega Games cartridge does not like having the MMFS ROM loaded. So it's there's a good chance that this will just fail. Let's start. Yes. Okay. Maybe if you can stop sharing your screen, I'll see your uh, visible oh. screen better. Much oh, better. sorry. Uh, let me do that. I'll stop the share. Oh, that's okay. better. Back to video, great. Okay, so. Put some monitor cables a little. So behind me is the uh, board that I put together for the Vintage Computer Festival. In front of me here is this, this Electron. Um, here is the upgrade, here is the lack of CPU, and here is uh, uh, what happens when you have a Mega Games cartridge and MMFS loaded at the same time. I just disabled MMFS, so let's give that another try. Ta-da! There's Elite loading off uh, the Mega Games cartridge that's actually a, it's, it's a soft Mega Games cartridge running inside the UEU. Um, I've also, um, implemented a serial port through the, um, through the uses the debug microcontroller. So I'm running Tom Seddon's bead link on the, uh, on my, oh wow, I just saw the chat, haha. <laughs> I'll go back and read that in a minute. Um, so yeah, so we're, uh, this is a bead link, so I can, um, There is Repton 3 loading over a USB connection to my laptop um, using BeadLink. It's not super fast right now. I'm running BeadLink in full debug mode, um, but it works. Um, also, yeah, MMFS using the, I believe that, it's not the BitBang Electron version. I think it's the, I think, uh, it's, it's whatever Hoglet put into the electronic PGA code. Um, so um, it's, I think it's the uh, shift register version. Uh, so let's see if we can get that to work or if I actually... Yep, there we go. So here we are loading off the SD card. So we've got, we've got some choices for filing systems here. Um, I don't want to pull this all apart and plug a plus three into it, but I'm pretty sure that works as well. Um, I'm gonna cautiously attempt that later, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, so some future, um, 
future possibilities for this. I mean, obviously I need to fix that buffer situation, make a new board, which doesn't have the bugs. Um, I really, really, really want to put some tests into this. Um, at work, everything, all the code that I work on is obsessively tested. I can make a change uh, fairly in a fairly haphazard kind of a way and run the tests and it will tell me what I've broken and if I've broken code belonging to another team, all that sort of stuff. Whereas here, I kind of, I changed some DHDL and I crossed my fingers. Um, now in the open source world, there's a ton of verification work that's been done by the very low community. Um, and there's also some things being done by the DHDL community, but as far as I can tell, it's not, I don't believe that there is an open source project which will run verification on mixed Verilog DHDL designs. The vendor software seems to be very, very expensive. Intel has, um, sells a version of ModelSim for $2,000 a year, uh, which is not what I want to be doing. I'd rather, you know, it's, it's an open source project. I want the tools to be free to. Uh, so I have the, the um, undesirable choice of either porting everything to Verilog or um, trying to expand Icarus Verilog's VHDL support. I may, I think maybe I can get away with the middle ground of simplifying some of the VHDL so it doesn't use any complicated features uh, and doing a little bit of hacking on Icarus Verilog's VHDL front end. It looks like you can't, it doesn't support entities right now in VHDL, which is pretty fundamental. I think basically you can have a Verilog design which pulls in VHDL, self-contained VHDL modules and Icarus will test them just fine, but you can't have a VHDL, you can't have a VHDL module that pulls in another module, which this project does all over the place. So um, yeah, let's see what I can do there. Um, I really want some configurable bank mappings. The, um, uh, the Electron has 16 sideways banks. Uh, four of them are blocked off, uh, two, uh, two mapped to the keyboard, um, two mapped to the, um, the basic ROM, uh, but the rest of them, you can do whatever you like. And so right now, um, right now I think I've got two of them matched to the Mega Games cartridge. Two of them, uh, two of them are sideways from maybe four of them are sideways from them. I think two are matched to the Mega Games cartridge. Two are left open for a plus one. Uh, four are sideways RAM, and then you've got the keyboard and the basic ROM, and then the top four. The top four, I think, are fixed. There's MMFS, B-Link, and a couple of others. <coughs> oh, the plus one ROM, the, the retro hardware plus one ROM. Um, so being able to configure them at, uh, at runtime would be amazing. Um, I'd really like to be able to say, um, I want this bank to be RAM right now. Uh, have the machine start up as a, as a standard Electron, but with a modified operating system ROM or a something replacing the basic ROM. So it would start up, load a menu and let you do stuff. And you know, it could do things like detect if there's a plus three connected, detect if you already had sideways RAM, so it shouldn't you know, trample that. Um, I'm pretty sure I can do an internal tube processor. The, um, the block RAM inside the FPGA is kind of limited. I think there's something like 42K and obviously I'm using 32 for the, the processor's memory. Um, there's uh, some for mode seven, there's something for the video. Um, so there's not a lot left, uh, but we have this SD RAM. And like I said, you can access it in 60 nanoseconds, which means up to, uh, I think 16 megahertz. Um, uh, I think it's, it's up to about 16 megahertz access. So I can run several micro, uh, several six five two's at full speed. Um, so I'm gonna try that. Um, there's all sorts of other things. Like if you want to do ridiculous things like have several, uh, have several processors in it um, to the point where, um, but, but you want to make it kind of fast, you can either do some sort of caching or 6502 accesses the zero page and the stack page quite a lot. So if you put those in block RAM and everything else in SD RAM, it could work quite fast. Video Mueller support would be amazing. Um, but I don't have the pins for it. I can either try to steal pins from something else or um, do something like fast serial output over the IGB lines or out that USB port or something like that. Te theoretically, I should be able to do like 200 megahertz serial output, differential serial output on this thing, although yeah, I have no idea. Uh, I have to play. Um, 
and uh, and obviously there's so much audio audio potential. We should be able to do full you know 24 bit audio through that DAC. I mean, it depends. I've never done an analog. I've never done a, a mixed signal design with both digital and analog parts, where the analog stuff had to actually be low noise. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is a very noisy DAC output. Um, it's, it's yeah, the, the the signals that come into it are quite fast. Um, they're you know I think there's something like 16 megahertz signal coming into the stack, and so separating that from the analog side is, probably requires things that I didn't do. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's all I can think of right now. So um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think I went over time a bit, but we've uh, I've I've got time and. Uh, time for questions. So, uh, I'm still reeling. <laughs> so, I so this is actually the first time I think this is the first time I've seen Dave Hitchens and Dave Banks's faces. <laughs> I, uh, um, <laughs> It's, it's, this has all been over, or discussions have been over email and forum threads. So it's, uh, I, so I, I'd hope to be able to get out, out, to, out to England for one of the, uh, the, the A-bugs or Risk OS meetups or something one day. But so the pandemic has actually been um, quite helpful in this regard, push forcing everyone to go online. So I get to join in. What's done in Verilog? Um, I think I did the uh, the flash driver the, in okay. Verilog. Um, basically, the things which I did entirely by myself are Verilog. I prefer to use Verilog these days because of the testing. Yeah, um, I do. I do as well now. Yeah, so I maybe maybe porting the whole thing into Verilog might not be a terrible idea. <laughs> there is well, a thing, there is a simulator called GHDL, which is quite a good. Verilog a VHDL simulator, but it doesn't do mixed signal. Yeah, yeah, it's that it's that mixed mode stuff that's the problem. Um, so yeah. I've 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 ported all of BBF PGA to Verilog so that I could run it on the Ice Storm stuff. Oh. And what, once you get into the swing of it, it actually doesn't take that long. There's okay. a, there's a very there's a VHDL to Verilog translator that gets you about seventy percent of the way there. So it's That's probably exciting. a day's it's probably a day's work to convert Electron FPGA to Verilog. Oh, all right then. This isn't as terrible as I thought. Um, and then we'll be able to have some uh, really nice tests. Uh, test the whole system with a. Um, there's a. I, I'm pretty sure I found a Verilog test uh, a test version of the SD RAM chip uh, which is ridiculous it's so funny seeing seeing SD RAM impl implemented using using that sort of test only the non synthesizable Verilog um, it's like for, for people who aren't familiar with this uh, Verilog and VHDL when you're um, there are these languages with an enormous number of features, most of which you can't use when you're trying to design stuff that works on actual hardware. Um, but if you're just doing it for simulation and testing, all of them are quite useful. You can do things like set this, set this uh, signal to one and then delay two nanoseconds and then set it to zero. Of course, hardware doesn't work that way. Hardware is like, well, it's flip-flops. Uh, stuff changes when, it, when the clock happens or sometime around it. Um, but in simulation, you can do whatever you like. Um, and so I've seen that, I think the flash chip and the SDRAM chip um, implemented like that uh, in, in sort of the, the test only. <laughs> yes, there is no eBay shop. <laughs> I'm actually reading the, reading the notes now. Uh, PyTube Direct for Elk, yes, I've done that. That's actually, uh, uh, I've, I've got a cartridge that, um, a cartridge that lets you connect a Pi uh, running Pi 2 Direct. Yeah, uh, that, that's fairly mainstream now. Uh, I mean, Dave Hitchens did his advanced tube interface that you can just plug a Pi tube Direct into. 
Yes. Um, there's there's the mi there's the minor issue of things like uh, the Z80 coprocessor uh, injects Beeb specific code back into the host, so you actually have to patch the coprocessor to get it to work on the electron. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, that's, that's sort of the it problem. With it, it uploads 6502 code that pokes back to the tube register. So if the, the tube register has moved, it doesn't work. Oh, yeah. And the, uh, the x86 one is even worse. I've not got that working. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of the problem with trying to run anything, anything designed for the B or features like the tube where they weren't expected to run anywhere else. Like, uh, yeah, registers all in the different, all in different places on the electron. I mean, so something I haven't tried at all with the the, uh, the, the UEU is um, is the the Beeb mode running Beeb FPGA on it. Um, which probably wouldn't be that hard. Uh, I think I need to do a translation layer for the keyboard because the um, the electrons keyboard is. Nothing like the Beeps one, um, but it, I think I think it'll be fairly straightforward to implement. Um, Kieran's asking how far did I get with the enhanced features? Um, well, I basically described everything that I managed to get working. Um, so none of those future things. What? Let's let's go right. I'm going to go right back to the start. What was it that we wanted to do for this? Okay, so fast RAM, yes. Uh, fast RAM works. I believe there's a four megahertz mode, although it crashes here because the um, the OS ROM can't handle it. Um, uh, but yeah, none of the enhanced audio and video or anything. Um, So, big question, when do we go into production? Whew, yeah, well, um, so I have, I have my uh, comp computing, um, computing priorities. It's like basically these two boards. So I designed this one here, which is the, the, the ROM switcher for the Archimedes, the A3000. At, uh, I, was, I, I think I was on, um, I was on parental leave right after my daughter was born at the, at the end of the um, And I was like, I will finish this board and I will get them out to people before I go back to work. <laughs> of course I didn't. Does that mean to say you weren't changing nappies in that time? <laughs> I was changing a lot of nappies, but also um, one month old babies sleep a lot. So <laughs> it was quite, it was actually a quite relaxing time. I mean, I, uh, I got woken up a lot in the middle of the night, but, um, Daytime is very, daytimes were quite, uh, quite relaxing. So then, you know, my daughter was sleeping, my wife was sleeping. I'd be, I'd be out here working on, um, working on circuit designs. <laughs> so I really wanted to get this one working, but I, um, I'm always, I'm always a bit concerned about reliability. I, I really don't want to be responsible for, for frying, frying someone's, you know, irreplaceable A540 or something. Uh, so I, I keep working on this machine. I keep working on this one and feeling kind of guilty for not getting it out to people. And the UEU happened and I put that all on hold and then I kind of felt that I would get back to Arc Flash and, and, and finish that. And then, I don't know, I ran out of enthusiasm for that and started fixing some machines for a while. Now here we are back on, back on, the, back on the UEU. So before we could go into production for this, I was like, I, I feel like I'm actually pretty happy with the reliability for this, and I'm pretty sure it's not going to destroy anyone's hardware. I have to do a bit more testing with a plus three, but um, there's less weird stuff that goes on inside an electron compared to an Archimedes. Um, so, um, so I think I think this is actually while wildly more complicated than than Arc Flash. I think it's a bit safer. Um, I need to fix those buffers. I need to fix the bugs. I mean, I, I would not be confident making a ton of them and, and selling them off to people, but making a small number of them and getting you know, people to do some testing, then 
so there's some potential. <laughs> um, Actually, yeah. Yeah. So for the black blob ULA owners, yes, that's um, that's hard. So the one of the, the big catches with this project is that uh, to install it in your machine, you either need to desolder your ULA or send your electron to Dave and get him to desolder your ULA. Uh, I think the black blob ULAs, are they, is that chip actually on the board or is it on its own little board with pins which is soldered into the No, it's just a, it's just a, a, a plug-in board, so you, you just desolder it as you would the socket and it just pops out. There you go. So, uh, so Kelvin, uh, you're you're still okay. Just uh, more risk of destroying your genuine ULA on on the on the way on its way out. <laughs> yeah, I really like the uh, the form factor of the electron too. I um, I I do I do feel it's. Uh, I I really want to have my have my electron with its with its closable with its closable case. Not right now because of all the. Um, all the debug connectors connected up to this thing, but um, being able to close the electrons case and have all that memory and interfacing stuff on the inside, it, it, this really feels like the right machine. <laughs> so I wonder how many electrons there really are. Kelvin says he has six. I now have three. I had two plus this one that Dave gave me. Um, I, I'm not intending on getting any more, but you know, you never know. Uh, I have A3000, so the machine I have the most of. I have one real A3000 and three um, motherboards, which uh, uh, Mark Hazman from Retro Clinic um, sold me because he got them in a, in a pack. Haha, <laughs> yes, nice. There's a, someone, is that Ed with his electron there? Um, approximate cost of this board, including the components of soldering stuff. Um, I think the PCB and the components, I think it's somewhere around $40 or 40 pounds, I'm not quite sure. The, um, the soldering, the assembly, that's a total wild card. Um, I believe in quantity. I, I'm, I think I've heard that um, you should basically budget uh, the entire cost of the components again for assembly. So if it's thirty or forty dollars for components, it's probably another thirty or forty dollars for assembly. Uh, I have no idea what the exchange rate with pounds is. I bet it's going up all over the place right now. Um, but uh, I think right at the start of the project, I said to expect about a hundred pounds for being able to buy one. Um, I mean, obviously that that it depends. It's like the um, if you're trying to actually make a company and make money and pay for development costs and things, I've heard that should you should be charging at least three times the. Um, if, if something you know, if something costs something costs sixty dollars to make all up, including assembly, you should charge three times that. You should charge one hundred and eighty dollars for the thing. Otherwise, you will lose money. But uh, I think most of us here aren't really expecting to make money on this, so we, we charge a bit less than that. But I think around the hundred pound mark wouldn't be off uh, for a, like a complete assembly board. Um, yeah, I'm, I thought I, I would make a bunch of these myself for just to send out to people to debug, but uh, it's, it's, I, I, I sat down with all the components one evening, stared at them for a while, and then I put them all away. It took so long. So, <laughs> this is, uh, even, even with all the reflow, it takes, it takes forever just to place them all. Yeah, I, I, I think once we get a stable bomb, we can uh, we can ask around, uh, especially over uh, see what the Chinese can do. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, so. if they if they're sourcing the components and building, uh, I think we can probably get that down a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I, I think, uh, and they'll they'll do small quantities as well. I. I I think I filled out a form to ask an American manufacturer uh, what they would do, um, and they would, they would, their their estimate was something like two thousand dollars for ten boards. So, whereas in China it's probably more like ten dollars a board. Bye, Charlie. Um, yeah. So I think it 
wouldn't be unreasonable to get a few boards made. Once uh, I think maybe once I've done the uh, redesign um, with the uh, new buffers and built up the board by hand to verify that that works, then maybe we could go, uh, we, should, we could see about getting a Chinese manufacturer to make you know, a run of 10 or 20 for the early adopters, people who don't mind maybe things breaking. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of electrons with Duff ULAs around that would yes. be too great a loss, or he could be fixed easily anyway with that. That's a good point. That's something I, you know, it's like I don't really see that over here in America. Um, I have a very small window into the kind of availability of this sort of stuff. Basically, what I see on eBay, who's willing to ship to the states, um, and it's you know. It, it costs something like 30 pounds to ship an electron to the U S. And so, uh, when I see people saying that electrons are worth five to 10 pounds, these are numbers that I never see over here. I paid 42 pounds for my first one and another 40, another 24 to ship it. Um, and that, that's, that's kind of you know, what you expect here. Um, so yeah, the broken ones don't make it over. Uh, so I should, I should also say, um, I, I think I mentioned budgies, uh, budgies kind of parallel project earlier. He's, um, he popped up on the, um, the ultimate electron upgrade uh, and, and uh, electron FPGA chats uh, and threads a couple of months back uh, and um, has built up a board with the same form factor but uh, without, the, without the extra RAM and flash and interfacing and stuff just as a, um, I, I, think, I think it was partly as a, as a kind of a practice, a circuit board design practice, but what he's produced is, um, is basically that uh, ULA replacement. If you've got an electron, you want it to still be an electron, you don't care about um, upgrading it, but it, it's, it needs a ULA replacement. I think this board would be excellent for that. Um, you can probably get some, you can probably do fast mode, but, um, uh, but without like, sideways RAM and stuff. So now we have two choices. It'd be interesting to see how this all goes. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're losing people, and uh, got more questions? Uh, yeah, go on, Phil. Um, did you look oh, at the... Hi. hi, how are you doing? Did you look at the TICB3T buffers? I haven't. Um, so there seems to be an endless, um, it's an endless supply of different kinds of buffers, and uh, I kind of poke around uh, every now and then and see you know, what's, what's showing up, but um, I tend to stick with the ones that I've used and have found to be reliable. And my pretty much, I guess after I kind of got burned by using LBTs, uh, um, I've just been designing with LVC and HCT uh, recently. Usually I've got enough. Um, I, I'm a little wary of the auto, the, the, the CB3T ones, are those, um, are those auto switching or are they? Um, yeah, they're, they're sort of, I think they're end-to-end -end FET things, but I, I've used them and I have to say I've not had a single problem with them other than they won't do CMOS levels, but they do TTL levels really well. And okay. you, you don't need to tell them which direction the bus is in. And uh, I, I had the same problem you had a while ago with um, you saying about the um, bus hold stuff, screwing stuff up. And I've not had anything with, like that with these. And I, you know, just... I hang thing off and they, they seem to be so bulletproof because I'm such a klutz and I, you know, put the three volt into the five volt and expect them to fry and they seem to just survive. So they're probably worth a look because they, the, some of them you get, I think you get 24 in a package, 24 pins and any of those pins can go in either direction. So they're, they're well worth a look. Yeah, that might be worth a look also for, um, reducing pin count using getting the smallest possible package uh, without resorting to things that Texas Instruments is about to deprecate. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know where they're going with the deprecation thing, but I think last time I looked, um, Farnell was stopping selling them, but you could get them direct from TI and they said they're not end aligning them. So they should be good for a few yeah. years. Yeah. And they are quite widely used. They're not like an esoteric, yeah. Thing. And I mean, it's, it's, go on. 
yeah, that's that's good. Sticking to, to widely used active components, I think is what I'm going to do from now on. Yeah, I've been stung so many times with that. Um, yeah. I guess the other thing on on you were saying about the sound stuff and all the audio processing and worrying about the analog circuits and stuff. Um, I was quite surprised I, when I knocked my stuff up. I didn't use a D DAC at all. I just used a one bit, and I did PW PWM in VHDL. And I expect it to sound really, really crappy. And it sounds absolutely great. It's, I'm, I'm sort of like blown away by how good it actually sounds. And I, I even hooked it up to a, a sound card and did put a sine wave through it and did like a harmonic distortion thing on it. And it came out as perfect as I think I was doing 12 bits could come out. And that was my really, really basic a resistor and a capacitor filter so okay. if you want to look at any of that i've got i've got stuff that we could look at offline if you wanted yeah that's actually a really good idea so um partly this is exciting because the DAC needs a ton of um a ton of passive components hanging off uh yeah. hanging off the side for power conditioning and and it's, there's something like a second order filter on the output of it and stuff like that um and also it uses quite a few pins from the FPGA. If I if I could ditch this, then maybe that's this could give me a bunch more pins for the um the VGA output. Uh, yeah, and the PWM PWM thing that I've used, I can't where I, I sort of I just picked it up somewhere on the internet and I fiddled about them myself. But it's like I think it's like five or ten lines of VHDL. It's and it's you know, it's not a lot of gates, it's a counter basically. Yeah. And a comparator and then output, you know, toggle the pin when you go past the count, it's so basic. And like I say, I expect it to be really crappy and I've just got one resistor, one capacitor on it. Cause it's running at like however many megahertz. You just stick a really simple filter on it and you're not going to be anywhere near the switching speed. So it's, exactly. it's, it's an easy way to go. Yeah. I mean, that's, so that's, uh, I didn't talk about this earlier, but I, I um, the cassette output from the uh, from the electron is, is an interesting thing. It's it's got like four uh, four levels, so it's, it tries to approximate a sine wave in a, in a blocky kind of a way. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was thinking of using a couple of pins and a little resistor ladder or something to do that, and then I realised that I could just do QWM it and get as sine like as I wanted. Um, Turned out that feeding a square wave into a cassette recorder works just fine. But, yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, using I could use PWM to make it a whole lot nicer if, um, yeah, if that turns out to be insufficient. Um, but that's that's really promising that, um, that you could get away with just a single FPGA output um, and get good sound. You can do a lot with. FPGAs in the uh, and analog. Um, back in the uh, 90s, uh, with a bit of trickery with some with two resistors and a capacitor, I was able to get composite video into an FPGA, and then another two resistors and a capacitor to get it back out again. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Um, yeah, it's not wasn't the world's greatest composite video source, but it was good enough that you could get composite video across. And basically, what you end up doing is um, in the I/O cell, uh, you end up with a little feedback path, um, and so it just tries and um, oscillates to try and track the composite video. You don't do anything in the anything in the clock domain, but that oscillation you then feed across the FPGA, which is good at. And then you filter it back out again. <laughs> and that gives you back your composite video again. <gasps> that's that's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, so one bit DAX and one bit ADCs are quite possible. Um, so you, yeah, you you, you, uh, you you can make a timed ADC if you ever need to do an ADC um, on the FPGA because the inputs um, cells are actually pretty fast comparators at the end of the day. Um, so if you effectively make a DAC, but, uh, you can use the DAC, uh, and the input cell to be a comparator to form yourself a little ADC, and then you can just track your signal. 
that's really clever. <laughs> And again, uh, it's only a few like literally only a few lines of Verilog to do that. Um, if you do get everything into Verilog, um, there's something called Verilator, which is often used for simulation. Yeah, I think uh, Icarus is the one I'm familiar with, but I I've, I keep seeing I might use Verilator at work, I think. For some things that the hardware people do, um, lots of people do because um, it's free. <laughs> it's the one that compiles uh, to C. Uh, uh, just C. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So you can you can actually simulate very complicated things. Yeah. So, where can I ask where your day job is? Oh, I, I work at Google. <laughs> Ah, it was uh, going to be that or Apple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know very much about um, what goes on in, in Google's hardware division, but uh, I do know that it's all very long. So <laughs> yes, and they keep on buying people. So uh, who who knows what they, of the companies they buy? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. No. So, but there's a lot of, a lot of PhD also there are a lot of porting when something that happens sometimes. Yes. So Phil, your, your earlier um, boards you made were stamped with Google, weren't they? Because obviously that's a, that's a condition of the employment. See that? It's a little dark. So they... Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead to the question. Oh, that was it. No, will, will the UEU have... Um, Google stamped on the boards as well, and it sounds as if they already do. <laughs> yes. So the um, the condition is basically uh, by Californian employment law, uh, things don't belong to you unless you do them entirely on your own time with your own equipment, and they have nothing to uh, do with what your your employer's line of business. The first the the first two conditions aren't too hard. I have plenty of my own time and my own equipment, but um, but Google's line of business is kind of connected to pretty much everything. And so it's quite hard to do something which has absolutely nothing to do with Google. The company recognizes that and they say, well, you're also allowed to contribute to open source projects. And you can start open source projects. And Google is fine with that. So basically how it works is the copyright's held by Google, but it's released under you know, a patchy license or a GPL or something. So you get all the rights that you get under those. It's just I don't own it, so I don't get to relicense it. I don't get to do that kind of stuff. If I um, if I left the company, I would only be able to use the code that I wrote under the condition of that license. So I just release everything under the Apache 2 license, which is pretty unrestricted. Um, also includes patent grants, I believe. So if I accidentally infringe any Google patents, then uh, you get a license to them by for, for this project. Um, something like that. Don't, I'm not a lawyer, but it's. I, I believe you're. I believe there's something in there. Yes, Karen. Uh, Karen mentions you can request copyright back. Um, but the process is a little long-winded. Uh, you basically, um, if if you're working on a project which, where, you can kind of make a case that Google doesn't really want to own it, doesn't have any interest in it. Um, so, I think. I think the company quite likes having a lot of open source software copyright Google. It's looks good, uh, but if you if you can kind of uh, if you you can you can request uh, you can request to have it under your own copyright, and sometimes they'll say yes. Oh, Karen says yes. So Karen is also a Google uh, and just has done that for his demos, so he gets to keep the copyright. But it it doesn't really bother me as long as as long as this stuff is open source under a sufficiently permissive license. I'm happy. Right. Thanks for thanks for answering that, Phil. Um, have we got any more any more questions before we uh, wrap up? I mean, we, we'll carry on. We'll stick around if um, people want to stay online. Not a question, but just to say that that was awesome. Thank you. That was really really interesting and lots of super interesting and uh, um, thought provoking things. So thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. 
Um, but yeah, it's a, a great finish to the day, I think. Um, I'm sure you've added to the numbers wanting, um, you know, you want to get the hands on a, a UEU once they're available. Um, and hope, so hope, hope we find a time to get it finished, tested and released. I don't know if there's any chance of it being ready to go into Christmas stockings this year. Is that a bit of a bit optimistic? Oh, yeah, I'm one. June could happen. Um, the, uh, so I, mean, I think I think I'm a bit ADD. I tend to I, I put put a lot of energy into whatever it is that is the shiniest thing at the time. So as, as long as this one stays the shiniest thing, <laughs> it's it's really what, I think I think that's how my brain works. Or if it starts to wane, Dave will get you in to do another talk. Hey, that's a, that's a good choice. So you can see when I stop posting on the UEU thread, and, uh, I guess I need some encouragement. <laughs> what happened since the last talk? Should we, should we put you down for the August one now? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, been a, it's been a bit of a bonanza for um, Electron fans today, hasn't it? You know, we, we had Dave Hitchens are reminiscing about press and his electron upgrades earlier than the zero X code and his uh, electron demos and, and the mountain panic conversion. And, um, and lastly, we've got your, you know, your talk on the, you know, the, the UEU. It's been great. Thank you. I think the arc Archimedes need to be shown a bit of love next. So I think that's what we're looking at doing at the next, you know, subsequent events is, uh, Kind of uh, factor a few more, uh, a few arc talks in. Well, uh, that'd be good. Yeah, it could give me a couple of weeks, but I could probably do an interesting talk about uh, about this little guy, and maybe the the A five thousand I poured thousands of hours into, attempted to restore, and stopped after frying that particular board. <laughs> but no, if if we can see a virtual round of applause for. Uh, Phil, and we'll um, I'll, I'll stop the recording now. <laughs>